Welcome to Mining Watch Canada's annual seminar. This year, our topic is green energy, green mining, and the Green New Deal. And before we go any further, I would like to introduce our uh, knowledge keeper and leader, Monique Manach. She's a knowledge keeper and a member of the Algonquins of Barrier Lake, and she's graciously agreed to open our session today. So Monique, would you please give us some guidance for the day? Miigwech, Jamie. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to, I'm in, um, presently I'm located in um, unceded, unsurrendered Algonquin territory, and I'd like to welcome you. Uh, to this territory, uh, Monique Manach and Dijnikos, Algonquins of Barrier Lake and Dojiba. My name is Monique Manach and I'm a member of the Algonquins of Barrier Lake. And uh, I'm so honored to be a part of this webinar. The work that Mining Watch does is just so vital, um, especially to our Indigenous communities. We don't have the, what the, the capacity to um, <coughs> do what needs to happen when um, when mining companies come, when they're um, they're doing uh, searches on our territory, we're not even aware they're there. Sometimes I, I've spoken about this before with my own community and how Mining Watch alerted us to the fact that um, um, they um, they were looking in the heart of our territory uh, for uh, for, min for minerals and to start mines and had laid claim. So um, I. Uh, uh, I know that the, the new Green Deal will be a, a topic of conversation today. Um, and I think that, um, you know, exploring what's in that deal and talking about how it can, how the communities and how, the, the, you know, how everyone can, um, can best um, respond, I think is, is so, so, it will, it will be a game changer. It'll be so very important to, to how we, um, move forward, especially, um, you know, we're looking at such huge changes in our environment and with global warming and, 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 and I think as a result, the pandemic, and I don't think that's gonna go away anytime soon either. I think that's gonna continue in various forms. I think it's just gonna become something that we have to um, incorporate into our lifestyles. But I would like to start this, um, open this space in a good way um, with words to the creator, creating a sacred space where these conversations can take place and where uh, everyone can share what's in their heart and what's in their minds in a way that benefits all. Kachimi Gwich, Jemnido, thank you, creator. We're grateful for everything you have placed in our homelands. We're grateful for the trees and for the rivers, for the lakes and for the streams. We're grateful for the birds, for the animals, and for the fish, and for all the good human beings. We're grateful for the sky world above us and for the mother earth beneath us. We're grateful for the bees and the insects and all those that help the plants to grow. We're grateful for the medicines and the ceremonies. We're grateful for our ability to prepare ourselves spiritually for the spiritual work we need to do. We're grateful for our ability to comfort each other and to be there for each other in good times and in times of trouble and anguish. We ask that you help us reach the wisdom of our ancestors so that we can take that and use that in our everyday life with our family and our friends and our communities. We ask that you help us speak good words, strong words, that will impact in a good way those around us spiritually and emotionally. We remember those relatives and friends who are suffering from illness and addictions and hope they have a good day today and that they will return to us stronger and able to, to act as role models and mentors. And we remember our roles and responsibilities to live our lives with great respect for all living things. Kachimi Gwich, Kachimi Gwich, 
Kachimigwich. Kachimigwich. Thank you very much. And I hope you have a wonderful webinar today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monique. That was lovely. So today, under our topic, green energy, green mining, and a Green New Deal, we're looking at the difficult contradiction at the heart of the renewable energy transition. The fact that generating, moving, and storing electricity requires a lot of metals and materials. The mining sector is working hard to take advantage of the climate crisis, painting mining as green because it supplies materials needed to support the green energy transition. But unless demand for both energy and materials are curtailed, environmental destruction and social conflicts will also continue to grow. And how can a Green New Deal address this contradiction? We will have three 15-minute presentations by our invited experts. There will be a discussion period after the presentations where the panelists will respond to questions from the moderator, that's me, and the audience. And you can put your questions directly into the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen or into the chat box where they will be collected. You can also vote up questions in the Q&A that you think are important. So I would like to introduce the first speakers, May Derrer and Dimitri Karatidi, who are with the Citizens Coalition Against the Nouveau Monde Graphite Project in Quebec, which is currently the largest proposed graphite mine in North America. Dimitri has a PhD in biochemistry from McGill and a master's in business administration from HEC Montreal. Dimitri is an entrepreneur and has worked in social responsibility consulting. He is currently a project manager in business development at McGill University's Health Center Research Institute. He speaks today as a citizen affected firsthand by the proposed Nouveau Monde Graphite project. May has degrees in literature and business administration. She was most recently a director of the Quebec Association of Pediatricians, a position she held for over 18 years. May is one of the spokespersons of the Citizens Coalition, which is a group that brings together more than 100 families, residents, cottagers, and workers in the region. I think May will speak and we'll bring Dimitri in for the question and answer afterwards. Hello, thank you for the introduction, Jamie, and thank you to Mining Watch Canada for this opportunity today to share with you a testimony of a very sad story, a story of devastation that citizens from Saint-Michel have been experiencing since uh, 20, 2016, the uh, announcement of the implementation of the largest uh, mine in Quebec at Saint-Michel-des-Saints. Before starting, I would just like to uh, give you a disclaimer of liability. The opinions presented today are not necessarily representative of the opinions and views of the associations, employers, or workplaces of the member, the board members of COPH. So what is our coalition? Well, it was uh, set up in 2016. It is a group of many citizens from the municipality coming from different sectors. The objective is to oppose the mining project. It promotes sustainable economy that is based on the main economies, forestry, resorts, and recreational tourism. We are not against electrifying transportation, not at all. In this, we have to be aware of the consequences of producing batteries. For instance, if we take a battery that is 85.85 kilos per kilowatt, we can estimate that this battery is going to need the equivalent of 73 kilograms of graphite. And to produce 
this quantity of graphite. The mine that is going to be set up in our region is going to generate a lot of waste. For instance, solid mining waste, about 4.8 tons, wastewater of about 1.222 liters, and GHG emissions, 0.4 tons. So as you can see, this is a huge amount of waste. These are estimates based on analyses made by Mining Watch Canada and Canadian reports in 2021. You can see what are the consequences of an electric battery. And where is this going to come, this graphite? Well, this is the scope of the project. It's the largest open pit mine in southern Quebec that is going to be located between Mont Tremblant National Park and Lac Toro Regional Park in a fragile ecosystem, a sensitive environment, and a resort area. And it's also a residential area. In this regional park, Lac Toro, we have a jewel. of Quebec. It is a huge freshwater lake that is about two hours north of Montreal. There's a huge pit of 2.7 kilometers in length, 430 meters in width, and 230 meters in depth. As for the annual production, we estimate it at 100,000 tons of graphite concentrate, and 60% of production is aimed at the EV battery market. When it comes to environmental risks, we summarized four of them that are very important. One is major water contamination, probably in perpetuity. The contamination is unavoidable when it comes to groundwater and surface water. You can imagine a waste of millions of tons in the regional park, Lac Toro, and the national park, Mont Tremblant. These uh, summer mining waste has a, is a source of huge environmental pollution. We estimate that there will be 100 million tons of mining waste in summer acid generation, generating deposited there in the Saint-Michel des Saints, and an essential point that we need to remember is that the methodology of managing mining waste hasn't been proven at the current time. When it comes to air pollution, there's going to be lots of it with uh, the dust, the air pollution, uh, the little particles for a minimum period of 26 years. The life cycle of the project is 26 years. For the, so for this entire period, there's going to be air, air pollution with these particles. There is going to be a loss of uh, biodiversity, deforestation, continuous noise, blasting, dust, Everything is already there. Also, a significant increase of GHGs. When we look at social impacts, contrary to what the promoters are saying, there is no accept, accepting by the society. Actually, there is social division in the community. What the promoter is saying is that it has been accepted by society and it is supported by the region's municipality that is not there. It was demonstrated at the public hearings in January that the promoter did not do their homework, not in an efficient way. They did not consult 50% of the population 
the resorters mostly. So it is not true. There is no social acceptability. There is a division in the community. And we need to emphasize this because there is a media war between them and us. So we are saying that there is no accepting by the community and they're saying that it is 80%. Eight Aboriginal nations were not, they were not consulted. They're not respecting the Atikamek nation of Manawan, especially since this mining project or this mine is going to be located on their lands. As for health impacts, there is going to be a lot of health impact, impacts and increase of risks. In fact, it already started. We have um, more stress and uh, psychosocial impact, an increase on impacts on people's health with the dust and everything else. These are impacts that are increasing constantly. Green marketing campaign and the role of uh, government. The greatest uh, strength of the promoters is in their ability to consciously and intelligently manipulate the public opinion. They are saying that the project is, uh, is green and citizens are believing this because it was repeated so much. To the extent that even the government seems to have been convinced by this image with the greenwashing strategy that is extremely well tried. The government is selling the project as being a green project and a responsible project, and they're selling it to the public and potential clients. It is selling it as a responsible project and a green project to potential investors. We don't know who they are. We still don't know how interested companies are. They might be interested in other, other um, places in Quebec. As for government complacency, what you see on the uh, photograph here, our economy minister is with the um, uh, Nouveau Monde Graphique team on site. Mr. Fitzibon, who we met in January, clearly told us and repeated that there was no issue with the main shareholder of the Palangers company that is registered in tax havens that has no or very little experience in the mining sector, but who is specialized in helping companies in difficulty. So our economy minister is very comfortable with an investor who has their headquarters in a tax haven. So we can wonder what is going on. Then there is a lot of waste of taxpayers' money on a speculative project. We would like the government to stop investing more money in speculative projects. They already invested so much. It is speculative. Reports have demonstrated that there is no viability. So we are asking the government to no longer invest, to stop investing public funds and taxpayers' money in this very speculative project. Also, neglect of uh, BAP recommendations. Well, the government did not consider the request of BAP. This is an organism that was created by the government to create all environmental projects and make recommendations to the government. However, the government uh, delivered uh, 
a few months ago, very quietly, a decree without taking into account the recommendations of MAP. So they received eight additional reports before issuing the decree. So the government did not respect this, and they authorized the project of Nouremont Graphite. We can wonder now about this and the government's campaign. They mentioned that they would like to to make a green shift and crack down on tax havens and have a green economy. However, what they are demonstrating clearly with this project is that we are very, very far from the promises made during their election campaign. If this is the case, they should backtrack and put a moratorium on this project so that they can receive the additional studies that were requested by BAP. We can wonder what the government is doing. We can wondering if they are not supporting sustainable destruction instead. In conclusion, we have the dreams of believing in clean energy and responsible minerals that we would like to see. But the reality is more mining waste, million of tons of mining waste, durable destruction, Saint-Michel de Seine is no longer going to have the same um, landscape. Our water and landscape is being destroyed. There are social impacts. And what I mentioned earlier, these are impacts. There are also impacts on tourism, people's health, and greenwashing. Well, that is what we have been experiencing for some time now. Now, what about solutions? Yes, we are 100% for the electrification of transportation, but not at any price, solutions exist. The government must have the courage to reform certain laws. It could be inspired by the five principles for a better transition proposed by a coalition of several actors and headed by the coalition, uh, Coalition Québec, Meilleur Mine. And what are these five points? Reduce at the source encourage and develop among, namely, uh, public, uh, affordable public transport, protecting the environment, water, and prohibiting um, spilling out uh, waste into the waters and protecting communities, uh, tourism, resorts, citizens in the communities apply the principle of polluter pays and also apply tax justice. Perhaps uh, there is one last point that I would like to add. Sam Michel Lesson is a reputation nationally and internationally for its a recreational uh, tourism and uh, resort, Sam Michel Lesson. It is um, integrated in the La Nodière uh, and the sector of uh, Tobière. Um, uh, uh, there was a lot, there are a lot of lakes, and of course, we want to keep this intact and promote our tourism activities that generate three hundred million dollars currently and three thousand jobs. And these are threatened by this mining project just for uh, Saint-Michel de Saint, the equivalent of $15 million and 300 direct jobs are all threatened. Thank you. I would now like to introduce Pyle Sampat. Pyle is the Mining Program Director at 
Earthworks based in the United States and co-leader of Earthworks campaign, Making Clean Energy Clean, Just and Equitable. Pyle leads Earthworks efforts to reform mining practices through corporate and markets campaigns, policy reforms and solidarity with frontline communities. Pyle is also co-author or editor of several publications on the mining and energy transition nexus, including the most recent one published just last week, Reducing New Mining for Electric Vehicle Battery Minerals. So welcome, Pyle. Thank you so much, Jamie. Um, I cannot actually take credit for that particular report, but um, I just want to say hello, namaste to everybody. My name is uh, Pyle Sampat. Um, I'm speaking to you from the uh, unceded Ohlone territories known as Berkeley, California. Um, I'm the mining program director at Earthworks, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting communities and the environment from the adverse impacts of irresponsible uh, oil, gas, and mining. Uh, we work on policy, research, and uh, advocacy strategies um, in solidarity with frontline communities uh, to reform irresponsible mining and to promote sustainable solutions that uh, take us hopefully out of the extract and dispose economy. Um, thanks so much to Mining Watch for this uh, invitation and. And, and I really want to give a shout out for the amazing work um, that Mining Watch does. It's, um, it's really an honor to collaborate with you and an honor to be on this panel with such um, inspiring speakers. So I will attempt to share my screen. I hope it works. Is the name of our campaign, our initiative, Making Clean Energy Clean, Just and Equitable. Um, and there are a number of organizations that are working in this space um, and Earthworks has been, um, I think our role has really been in, in some other framing and, and narrative uh, and, and coalition building work. Um, but I just wanna really acknowledge the work that's being done uh, more broadly in our networks. Um, so as I said, we're um, an organization that's headquartered in the US. We have over 30 years of experience um, supporting uh, communities on the front lines of extractive industries. Um, and what we've seen in the course of our work is that in the, in the last few years, um, increasingly, whether it was based in fact or not, a lot of the claims for uh, new mining have been centered in this narrative of, we need this for the green transition, uh, including the frame of critical minerals, which is a um, it, it really is a frame. It's a messaging tool um, to focus um, from, from the mining industry's perspective to really focus attention on a pretty large group of minerals that are considered critical. Um, and we can, we can dismantle that notion um, at the very front end. Um, we don't use that term uh, critical. It's really a greenwashing narrative that's used as a justification to uh, expand mining in some of the most pristine ecosystems in the world, um, including the Bristol Bay watershed in Alaska um, and in uh, the rainforests of Indonesia and Papua New Guinea. Um, it also poses threats to even the deep ocean through the, the um, impending risks around uh, deep seabed mining. And um, as we heard so eloquently from, from our previous speaker, um, you know, the impacts on, on communities on the front lines of extraction are significant. Um, at the very front of, uh, of this conversation, the beginning, I'd like to just frame it and say that we believe that we need to decarbonize, we need to make the transition to a renewables powered future, but that cannot happen at the cost of communities and the environment through increased uh, mining impacts and increased extraction. And in fact, I think it is really an Achilles heel uh, for the, the green um, uh, transition and the low carbon transition if these um, risks are not addressed proactively. And we may be able to see this as a simultaneous transition, not only to a low carbon um, um, energy economy, but also a more sustainable minerals economy and to really reduce our dependence on irresponsible mining, um, advanced solutions that recirculate minerals and ultimately really make systemic shifts so that we are not um, extracting and disposing 
Um, so we really can't be replicating the mistakes of the dirty fossil fuel based energy system we're seeking to replace. Um, and in order for that to happen, we've got to act now. Um, and there really are, um, as you'll see in the presentation, there are interventions uh, and solidarity and organizing opportunities to ensure that that doesn't happen. Um, I'm sure many of you here in the audience will be very familiar with the kinds of impacts that mining has. And so I don't need to go into each of these slides uh, or to into each of these impacts, but it's a you know very, fairly wide um, spread range of, of uh, impacts around human rights, forced displacement, um, pollution in the form of um, ongoing pollution that we were just hearing about, um, air pollution and, and water, but also some catastrophic um, disasters such as the Mount Bali uh, um, disaster in BC and Brumaginho in, in Brazil. Um, and what's also really uh, significant is that uh, metals mining is really carbon intensive. It has a significant carbon footprint uh, responsible for at least 10% of global carbon emissions. Um, risks to various ecosystems, including marine environment, freshwater environment, um, and has disproportionate impacts on indigenous peoples. Um, and so to really frame our understanding of these issues, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just walk us really quickly through some key findings from two pieces of research that were conducted by the University of Technology in Sydney, um, Institute for Sustainable Futures, and they can be found at that URL um, up there. Um, one is um, projections around what uh, demand might look like, and that was from 2019. And the second, which we released last week, uh, is around you know how can we obtain some of those minerals without digging huge holes in the ground? Um, how can we find recycling, circular economy, and reduction strategies? Um, so from the first report, uh, we focused on 18 uh, different minerals um, that were uh, significant in clean energy technologies, uh, including solar and wind. Uh, and battery and EV technologies. And what the research found was that the, um, I'm just gonna switch very quickly to the next slide, um, that the minerals that were of the greatest concern were, and, and the greatest, uh, uh, the most um, concerning trajectories of growth were those that were needed for uh, EV uh, batteries in particular. Um, and those were nickel, cobalt, um, lithium and copper. Um, that is not to say that the projected um, demand impacts for earth minerals, graphite, um, and some of these other minerals, manganese, are not um, significant. It's just kind of what was really striking. And what's really important to keep in mind with this slide is these are projections. This is not this is not kind of divine truth. Um, it, the you know similarly with projections by the World Bank, projections by the International Energy Agency that were released today. Um, this is where, you know, without any changes, we're sort of would be headed in order to meet those um, those those warming goals. That said, there are many interventions and and mid, mid course corrections, early corrections that we can take to uh, significantly um, shift some of these projections. Um, and as I, as I mentioned earlier, the, you know, what was really striking was that the battery metals um, were really driving this acceleration, uh, again, both in terms of the claims that were being made, as well as um, in terms of some of the numbers we were seeing. And because we're at this kind of nascent juncture, this, um, this early stage in the sector's growth, um, because EVs are being centered so much in climate policy, and because there's a, really an opportunity to focus on um, electrified public transit and mass transit uh, and shifts in, in transportation, um, this seems like you know, a really critical focus. Um, and it is, as the, the next piece of research will show, it's, it, it really is the moment at which to be making um, policy um, and design and um, other you know, commitments and, and interventions. And, I think Thea will be talking more about this as well. Um, 
So this is more detail than you need, but but real quick for now, you know that the the three minerals that um, I'm focusing on here with some some impact uh, overviews are uh, nickel, cobalt, and lithium. And just to give you a snapshot of where the impacts are uh, occurring um, for nickel, um, Canada, Russia, Australia, the Philippines, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, and Caledonia have been some of the um, uh, regions that have um, documented devastating cases of damage to freshwater and marine ecosystems um, through um, ocean mine waste dumping. For cobalt, a lot of the attention has been focused on the Southern um, Democratic Republic of Congo, um, where there are significant, there have been significant um, human rights abuses, um, water and air pollution, um, a lot of uh, corporate uh, malfeasance in the form of corruption and, and tax evasion. And yet the attention has really been focused, a lot of the dialogue has been focused, um, or maybe our attention has been shifted intentionally to, the, to what's happening at the small scale artisanal um, cobalt sector, mining sector, um, where in fact, there's been a lot of effort um, to cooperate and to, to make, to drive changes. So, um, you know, wanna make sure that we focus on the large scale mining impacts um, of cobalt. Um, and lithium, which Theo will be talking more about, our next speaker, um, many of the largest reserves in the world are found in South America under the salt flats of Chile, um, Bolivia, and Argentina. Uh, but we're also seeing um, exploration in um, the Western US, for example, um, and Cumulatively, um, these have been the source of a lot of disputes um, and water rights issues in particular, um, given the fragile desert ecosystems in which this um, lithium occurs. Um, and so just moving to, whoops, I think I, here we go. Um, moving to kind of what we can do about this. If we're not going to obtain the minerals um, by extracting them from the ground, um, where are we going to, how are we going to obtain them? That's often the question that industry is posing and in particular posing them in a way that indicates we have to extract, you know, our, our hands are tied. This is what we need to do. Um, so we commissioned this research from the University of Technology, Sydney, that showed that um, with boosts in, um, in, in, in policy, you know, sort of shifts in policy, um, and expanded uh, producer take back and, and other solutions, um, we could obtain between 25 and 55% of lithium, cobalt, nickel, and copper from uh, secondary sources from recycling. And um, I encourage you to read the research um, some more, but it, you know, it sort of, it varied depending on the, the sources um, uh, whether we were in, what we were including in that secondary feedstock. Um, oops. And then in terms of, you know, it's not just recycling, there are opportunities for reducing demand um, through uh, non-recycling uh, uh, strategies, including extending battery lifetimes. Um, Currently, these are you know, estimated between eight and a dozen years typically, but there's some proposals around extended lifespans that are um, 20 years or more. Um, looking at second life applications so that we are not um, essentially you know, looking at recycling solutions so much as reuse, um, repurposing. And then some of these um, systemic shifts around um, how we can perhaps tap into public transit or other um, solutions that move us away from private car ownership and private car dependence and really kind of um, amplifying and accelerating uh, public and bike transit as um, opportunities. I think my, um, and so I'll just, I think this is my last slide um, or second to last. Um, really focusing in on kind of how we're gonna drive this change. Um, as the slides indicated, the previous slides indicated, um, you know, there's a range of strategies we can, we can uh, employ to really boost recycling solutions. Um, policy interventions will be needed to really make those shifts. And 
most importantly, to remove the barriers that really tilt the balance, um, tilt the scales in favor of new extraction. And we see that in you know, the US and Canada um, where um, policies essentially you know, uh, incentivize new extraction over secondary use. Um, and, and some of the barriers are also currently in place, um, for example, with um, non-standardized battery technologies that make it really hard to have um, modular uh, repair and, and um, dismantling at the, at the end of life or at the point at which um, repurposing is sought. And it's very important to center um, the health and safety of workers and communities near recycling uh, facilities or who would be impacted by recycling to ensure we're not creating new sacrifice zones or new injustices through um, these secondary uh, markets. Um, we know that there is currently new mining underway. We know there's there are existing mining operations and there are new proposals and where um, such mining does occur, um, operations must adhere to stringent environmental and human rights standards, such as those developed by um, the Multi-Stakeholder Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance, um, where there's independent third-party assurance of compliance and there's civil society oversight and governance. Um, and so it can't just be mining companies saying we're doing the right things, but there, there needs to be uh, civil society governed systems such as IRMA that provide that oversight. Um, you know, and as you know, in the, in, in the long term, why do we have companies that are focused on digging minerals out of the ground instead of providing materials and the services um, that are that those materials represent, which would perhaps um, you know encourage those companies to find the most inexpensive, uh, low impact ways to to produce them. Um, and as noted in the in one of the previous slides, we really need to be rethinking. Um, you know, demand and and uh, consumption systems. Um, it's my last slide here, and and um, reprioritizing our. Um, um, uh, I'm sorry, I this is covered here, but um, reprioritizing um, public transit, equity and access to the benefits of these materials, um, and ultimately solidarity and collaboration between civil society and communities. Um, and that's it. I'm sorry if I went over. Thank you, Pyle. That was excellent. And I especially appreciated your challenge just at the very end there. It was a, a fantastic framing of the question that we're, I think, all grappling with. I would like to introduce Thea Riofrancos as our last speaker today. Thea is an assistant professor of political science at Providence College in the United States, an Andrew Carnegie Fellow and a Radcliffe Institute Fellow. Her research focuses on resource extraction, renewable energy, climate change, green technology, social movements, and the left in Latin America. These themes are explored in her new book, Resource Radicals from Petro Nationalism to Post Extractivism in Ecuador, and her co authored book, A Planet to Win Why We Need a Green New Deal. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, Boston Review, The Baffler, N Plus One, Descent, and Jacobin, among others. Welcome, Thea. Thank you so much. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, and I think that folks in the audience will note some resonances between my presentation and Pyle's presentation and May's. And I hope that those rather than being repetitions, help draw out some shared themes and kind of different angles to approach some similar problems. So my presentation is entitled The Extractive Frontiers of the Green New Deal. And that uh, lets you know that I'm gonna focus on the Green New Deal a bit, which has been mentioned, but not really defined yet. But to begin with, uh, I wanted to situate us a bit in the climate crisis, which is, covering over and informing all of our presentations, but I thought it would be good to remind ourselves of how deep and accelerating this crisis is. So right now the world is on a pathway to far, far exceed not only the Paris Agreement's uh, two degree uh, target, but the, uh, of course, the intergovernmental uh, panel on climate change 1.5 degree um, target. So we are nowhere on track uh, for either of those targets. 
Um, and also the climate crisis, it's extremely important to note, is deeply structured by global inequality and injustice. So what these images show on the left is that um, the, top, the richest people in the world are responsible for half of lifestyle-related carbon emissions. And on the right, this is mirrored by the fact that the richest countries in the world are the most historically responsible for the climate crisis and also responsible in the present with the US having the highest per capita emissions of any country in the world. And this is on the other hand, uh, mirrored by the inverse relationship with uh, between climate responsibility and climate vulnerability. So those countries and places that have contributed the least to the climate crisis are in turn the most vulnerable to the harms of the climate crisis, a situation that many have dubbed climate apartheid. This intersection between the climate crisis and the crisis of inequality is exactly the intersection that the idea of a Green New Deal confronts um, with a slew of policy proposals that are quite ambitious to dramatically and aggressively reduce carbon emissions. And here I'm talking about reducing the US's carbon emissions. For now, I will present the Green New Deal as domestic policy and I will get into its global implications a bit later. So to dramatically and quickly reduce carbon emissions, uh, to do so uh, with a very involved public sector, with public investment in the energy system and forms of public community and worker ownership of that energy system as well, um, with a just transition for workers currently working in the fossil fuel and related extractive industry and communities that have borne the brunt of the climate crisis. Um, we would in part augur that, that uh, just transition by guaranteeing millions of green unionized jobs in all of the sectors of the economy that need to be transformed in order to mitigate the climate crisis and also be more resilient against already baked in warming and extreme weather. And just to give you one example of those economic sectors, this could look like constructing millions of green, of units of green social housing uh, that uh, are affordable uh, to, to working class and poor people and that simultaneously address the housing crisis. So these are the most ambitious, lofty, and bold demands of the Green New Deal movement. And I've given you some images to give you a sense of what that movement looks like. It is around the country, it's in New York City, it's in the Gulf South, um, and it's in Washington DC where movements are allied with progressive and left-wing members of Congress to push these ideas and, and um, codify them in legislation. And I'm happy to talk about any aspect of this um, and the role of DSA, the Democratic Socialists of America, which I belong to um, in the Q&A. But I wanna pivot immediately to the global implications and specifically the material and resource implications of these dramatic transformations that uh, we need to implement in order uh, to address the climate crisis, to mitigate it and to create more resilient communities. So as we've heard from both of our presenters, I won't dwell on it a lot, the energy transition is extremely mineral intensive. This is uh, uh, evidence both in the array of minerals that, that are currently needed on current prevailing pathways uh, towards decarbonization. So this image gives you a sense of that. And there also it's also evidence in the dramatic demand projections. As Pyle very importantly noted, these demand projections are contingent on a host of political and economic decisions that determine the volume and rate and conditions of extraction. And I will come to those in a moment, but I still want to note that the World Bank uh, projects 500% increase in demand in lithium, graphite, and cobalt, some of the minerals we've already heard about today by 2050. We've also heard, and I will not uh, uh, redouble my, uh, my co-panelists' uh, excellent explanations, but we have heard, I want to remind us of grave impacts of the mining sector. And this does not matter if the, the end use application is, is um, you know, a sort of traditional technology or infrastructure or a green technology, right? The impacts are the same locally. There are impacts on wildlife, freshwater and marine ecosystems. There are enormous quantities of waste produced by this sector, solid and liquid waste. Um, and the waste itself is often toxic to human health and to ecosystems. Mining also exposes directly affected communities to grave health impacts, oftentimes, especially respiratory ailments, as we heard May speak about. 
territorial dispossession, and outright violence on the part of state, paramilitary, and corporate actors that use violence to enforce sectors that are considered quote unquote strategic or critical. Workers at mining installations also face health and safety risks and minimal protections and oftentimes face retaliation when they try to unionize. And overall, this kind of negative picture is completed by the fact that workers and communities at extractive sites receive paltry economic benefits in stark comparison to the obscene profits of the global mining sector. So let's zoom in on lithium for a moment, which is the focus of my research. I've conducted a bunch of field work in Chile, and I know that some of the folks that I've spoken to in Chile are, are in the audience right now. Um, and um, lithium, as we've heard briefly from Pyle in, in her presentation, is a key input of lithium ion batteries. Lithium ion batteries are in your cell phones, laptops, you know, some of the technologies that we're using today to host this virtual webinar. They are also in larger format in electric vehicles, electric buses, and also in utility scale batteries that are necessary to store renewable energy that is intermittent, so I'm talking about sun or wind, um, on grids that function with renewable energy. As I noted earlier, and as Pyle also noted, this demand for lithium due to the projected demand for electric vehicles and lithium ion batteries and energy storage is projected to increase dramatically. At the same time, and related to this demand increase, some market analysts are predicting a supply crunch. Uh, what that means is a gap or a lag between projected demand and available supply. This supply crunch or the fear or perception of it can likewise uh, incentivize uh, faster and more rapacious extraction. And that will be a theme of the next uh, few points that I'll make. So um, complementing this kind of uh, supply and demand side picture is the fact that states in the global north, policymakers in the global north, in the US, in the UK, in Canada, in the EU see themselves as in a race or a scramble to secure what they call critical minerals. There are key parallels with the age of empire um, with this scramble to secure land and resources in the global south. And what this does is risk um, further fast tracking and weakening of environmental regulations for these projects. I also wanna note because it's, it's quite important that this race or scramble is often seen through the lens of this so-called new cold war with China, a cold war and uh, framing that I think we should be extremely skeptical of in part because it actually undermines the cooperation needed for um, to address climate change, but also because it's incentivizing more rapacious extraction. Policymakers in the global North uh, see China as quote, dominating these supply chains and their extractive frontiers. And so to play catch up, there's this spur and this uh, um, sort of, uh, a spate of new projects across the global north, um, and we heard about one of them today in um, in in in, um, in the graphite project in in, in Quebec. So, um, what are what are the private sector actors doing? There's similar discourses and strategies circulating in the private sector. We have um, lithium miners and electric vehicle companies saying that we need new extraction, but they're also saying something else, which Pyle and actually May both also discussed, which is that their um, raw materials for green technologies are sustainable, are responsible, and are green. I want to note, though, and this maybe is like an additional point to the ones that Pyle and May made, that when lithium miners and electric vehicle companies make these claims, I think as activists, we should see them as openings. That means that these companies are worried about their green branding and worried about it as a liability if they are associated with environmental impacts, human rights abuses, et cetera. And I also wanna say that the very fact that there's so much discourse in the mining sector around sustainable and ethical sourcing is itself an outcome of really militant and, and in some cases successful community protests, NGO campaigns and investigative journalism, all of which is helping reveal the social and environmental costs of the renewable energy transition. And now I wanna pivot immediately to giving you a little bit of a sense of what uh, resisting what activists call green extractivism, which I think is a quite apt um, and trenchant term, uh, what that looks like around the world. And, and really to emphasize that the lithium frontier is expanding and moving around the world, right? So the global protest is following the expansion of that frontier. Um, to begin with, we have protest um, 
years of protest in, in Chile, which is one of the top two global producers of, of lithium, right, right up there with, with Australia. Communities target impacts on the water system and the lack of prior consultation of indigenous communities. We have similar concerns in Argentina, neighboring Chile, and a similar environment and ecosystem. The lithium frontier, though, as I said, is expanding. So Portugal is a small producer in global terms, but it's Europe's top producer, and European policymakers are really pushing for Portugal to have a much expanded mining industry. But this has been met with vociferous protest, and actually that protest has been successful in slowing down or in some cases removing from certain sites from potential extraction altogether. So that's an area to keep an eye on and to be in solidarity with. Then here in the United States, which is where I'm speaking from, we have a, a new project in Nevada called Thacker Pass, and that has been green lighted by the Bureau of Land Management. It sits on public land, it's worth noting, but it's also been the site of protest from environmentalists, ranchers, and the Fork McDermott Paiute Shoshone tribe uh, for impacts on, on the environment and for the lack of prior consultation, as well as, and importantly, the fact that the project has been really fast-tracked and rapidly approved by government agencies without the proper consultation of, of local people. So that gives you a sense of the protest. And, and these are sort of gonna be my concluding and synthesizing thoughts. What this can seem like and what sometimes it honestly feels like to me as a researcher and an activist um, and a Green New Deal advocate as well, is that there's like a zero sum trade-off. Like either we confront the climate crisis or we protect local livelihoods, environments um, from um, the impacts of mining and respect rights to self-determination and consultation and consent of indigenous and other directly affected communities. It can feel like it's either or. But I wanna really concur with the concluding slides of May and Pyle to say that it's not zero sum or that it only appears to be zero sum because of the prevailing mode of the energy transition, the prevailing approaches and economic imperatives, profit imperatives and, and, and designs of systems and technologies. So I wanna suggest uh, resonating again with the last presentation that there are in fact multiple pathways to a rapid and globally just decarbonization, right? There's not just one pathway and one set of supply and demand indicators. Instead, there are different ways forward. And I wanna just make those contrasts clear, right? So we have one way forward, which I refer to as a privatized system of auto domination. That's pretty strong language, but I'm speaking from the United States where we have a transportation system that is completely car centric, very environmentally destructive, dangerous for, for pedestrians, right? Resulting in lots of fatalities. Um, or we can expand mass transit, cycling and walkability, which by the way, in combination with one another would reduce resource intensity. A lithium pow uh, battery powered bus does use some lithium, but it's serving many more passengers than an individual car that sits in a garage all day. So it's about the rational use of resources that come um, that are limited and, and, and come from a planet you know, with, with environmental limits and also about encouraging non-vehicular forms of, of transit as well. Um, in addition, we need to do much, much, much better around recycling and materials recovery and, um, and around how these technologies and infrastructures are designed. And this has to happen through strong regulations. We can't expect companies to recycle on their own. We need to require that they recycle. In addition, and this is a specifically important in the United States, we need to dramatically reduce and simultaneously make more equitable our total energy consumption. Part of the reason that our energy system, including in its renewable form, requires so much physical infrastructure with such a big material footprint is that our energy demand is so high. Part of the reason it's so high is it's inefficient uh, in terms of the, the, um, the, the use of energy, but also that it's deeply unequal and the affluent use just tremendous amounts of, of energy. In addition, and, and lastly on this policy point, um, when we think about external relations, the way that the US is embedded in the global economy and relates to other economies, we need to integrate indigenous rights, environmental rights, and labor protections as first and foremost in our trade policies, because these trade policies are what help govern the flows of resources across borders. Uh, and finally, I just want to emphasize, if it's not clear enough, that the energy transition is a material transition. It has a material footprint 
um, and it is going to transform physical landscapes around us. In many cases, hopefully for better, um, making more resilient, equitable communities uh, that can mitigate climate change, but also unfortunately requires a lot of mining. And we need to think very strongly about how to reduce the mining and reduce the resource intensity about of the energy transition. And then final point here, I want to just suggest as myself a Green New Deal advocate in the United States that our principles of the Green New Deal, principles of equity, um, of, of addressing the climate crisis and other environmental crises head on, of leaving no community or worker behind in that process, need to apply across borders, across scales, and across every node of the extraction and production of green technologies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thea. Before we turn to the audience questions, though, I have some questions, and I'm going to go back to our panelists, and I would like to ask um, each of you one question just to kick things off. So for May or Dimitri, I want to ask you, you know, this, this struggle must have really thrown your lives upside down, you know, from just working to have a decent life for yourselves and your community to having to figure out how to fight a proposed mining project and a big one. So to you, what has to change in terms of people's expectations, whether as citizens, voters, or as consumers, so that this doesn't keep happening? It's a, it's a big transition from going uh, from a peaceful community into a mining community. And it, uh, it definitely changes the dynamics, I think. Um, I think we did the right thing to organize ourselves in the community and try to uh, somehow oppose the project to the best of our knowledge and our capabilities. Um, the, the biggest upset perhaps was the, the fact that regional government uh, always was in support uh, of the project and this was a major constraint. Uh, th of course, they had their own reasons, uh, some of them, uh, and most of them actually economical, purely economical. Um, uh, but uh, there was never an opportunity to open a dialogue with them uh, to discuss about the project, about its consequences on the, um, on the region uh, from the environmental standpoint and from the social standpoint. Um, whether it actually brings sustainable development to the region we were never listened. And that was one of the major constraints. Uh, and of course, uh, later on, uh, it led to a huge division within the community between people who were in favor of the project and against it. And it, it just complicated uh, things so much more. Uh, this gap is practically unbridgeable today, uh, in my opinion, uh, personally. And uh, if only the community could have actually unite and uh, decide on the project together, or at least discuss it, um, it would have been a step forward. And I'd like to turn to Pyle and ask you, you know, you've put a lot of energy into these issues for many years. And a lot of things have changed when it comes to how people understand the impacts of mining and what it does to communities and ecosystems. But a lot of things haven't changed. So what do you think is moving in the right direction and, and what gives you hope at this point? Yes, I, you know, I was thinking uh, as I was preparing this PowerPoint about the turning up the heat conference about a year and a half ago in Ottawa. And, and, I, and I was thinking that there has been such a um, scaling up of the discourse in these last year and a half to two years, um, at least in the civil society space. I think that um, some years ago we saw, you know, mining companies getting ahead of this and really kind of framing and owning these messages. Um, and, I, and I do think that there's been tremendous coordination and um, pushback um, from civil society in a very prompt manner. I, I think it hasn't gone so far ahead of us. Um, so I, I think that the in the years that I've been doing this work, that the, the global coordination and, and organizing and solidarity um, and networks um, and intersectional networks across different 
um, uh, you know, across different fields um, between um, labor, environmental groups, and indigenous groups, and across uh, regions has been really inspiring, and I think going in the right direction. Um, and in terms of of what isn't, I think that you know, power is still not not concentrated with us. Um, and you know, overall, the trajectories towards um, increased mining um, and the pressures to mine ever more pristine, uh, untapped uh, ecosystems and regions, you know, it continues. But I really do think that some of these questions are um, uh, at, at a head right now. I will say though, that you know, even as I wrote those words, material service provider in my PowerPoint, I remember that 20 years ago, um, there was a Canadian uh, mining company that described itself as such and was quickly acquired by another Canadian mining company and another Canadian mining company. And again, and you know, and that model kind of went defunct. So those those barriers to making those systems changes are still entrenched and um, there's still a lot of work to do to, to rip them. Yeah, no doubt. Thank you. And for Thea, so coming back to the, the Green New Deal, you've been directly involved in developing the proposals for the, the US Green New Deal. Um, what would you say is the one thing that people in the global north, that's, that's us, uh, pushing for climate action really need to understand? What, what is it that we find most difficult to incorporate into our thinking? I think that uh, it's exactly what we've been talking about today. So I hope this isn't redundant, though I'll try to add a bit, which is that you know, the, the energy transition isn't just like clean technologies and renewable energy that comes from nowhere, right? It involves like a, a whole set of infrastructures um, and forms of extraction and transformations to landscapes. And those are, by the way, some of the most contentious pieces of the energy transition, even in the global north, right? Which is part another reason why it's it's quite important to reduce overall energy demand. We have seen uh, conflicts over land use in the global north around utility scale uh, renewables as well, right? So, so I think we need to, we sort of can take those insights that we might be somewhat aware of more locally and expand them to the whole globe and just think about how every single economic activity under global capitalism is is cross border. It is transnational. It is connecting time, you know, time and space at you know in, at, at great distances. And to just have that in mind, um, I don't want that to per se lead to like a nihilistic position. And I know that I think Pyle emphasized the importance of decarbonization in order to avoid this like sort of idea, like well, then nothing can be done, right? Like if anything we do is bad or has bad impacts, I don't actually think that's politically useful. And I want to remind us that. In addition to these demands of mining affected communities, the central demand of the global climate justice movement for decades is that the global north in an equitable and in its, you know, in light of its historic responsibility way, dramatically reduce its carbon emissions, right? And so for the global north to dramatically reduce carbon emissions, trans transformations need to occur but transformations can occur in different ways, right? And so I just want those dual kind of goals to, to hopefully feel more complementary and for the material requirements of the energy transition, rather than feel like it's opposed to decarbonization to instead help us rethink how decarbonization occurs in the first place. Um, that's one piece. And I just wanna add one other thing, which is to just kind of situate us in the current political, economic, and social context of countries in the global South right now. We are in a pandemic. Um, we have a situation of vaccine apartheid that intersects very cleanly with, unfortunately, with climate apartheid. The same places in the planet that are experiencing the worst effects of global warming that have not contributed hardly anything to global warming are also being denied a life-saving vaccine. Also, in addition, their economies have been totally devastated by lockdowns and shutdowns and just depressions in global trade. Uh, the debt, the sovereign debt in the global south is at just like astronomical world historic levels. In Latin America is one of the places where there's the most debt. And the reason I bring all of this in is not to just remind us of all the 
tragedies that I think many of us are aware of, but it's to say that it's conjunctures like that that can incentivize extraction. It is governments that are indebted, that have populations with dire social need, and that do have resource deposits in their territories that can just like feel pushed to like, okay, the fastest way that we can generate revenues to deal with all these issues and to pay off our debt is to extract more. And that's why I think in the global north, we need to make demands around vaccine equity, around canceling sovereign debt, around redistribution for climate resiliency so that governments are not, don't feel pushed or incentivized to turn to extraction as the only mode of economic development. And I just wanna kind of situate and draw some of those connections. Yeah, and then you come back to the uh, the falsehood, the the, the false uh, promise of prosperity from mining, which is something that you know we see promoted over and over again in different parts of the world, and and uh, it's you know pretty much an illusion that this is a way for this is a way for public uh, benefit to to be generated. It's a it's a way to make profit for investors. Um, and for capital, it's it's not for communities and it's not for governments. Even in the most successful cases, it's it's uh, you know the the public benefits do not outweigh the the public liabilities in terms of public health, in terms of uh, environmental damage, in terms of social damage, and and we see this over and over again. And and try to get that message through to people that, that this you know whatever whatever you think you're going to get out of it. Um, it's important to do the math much more carefully than I think people tend to, um, even well-trained people in government. So, uh, you know, we, we need to keep that in the frame as well, that it, it's it's a false promise. I've got a whole bunch of really good questions. I'm going to try to group them a little bit. So the questions around Nouveau Monde Graphite have to do with uh, two things. One is around the, the company's efforts to become, um, to be a 100% electric mine. Um, you know, so supposedly no greenhouse gas emissions from the mine itself, which is an interesting tactic that we've seen coming from from a few different companies. And the other one is uh, what kind of collaboration there's been with the Atikamek First Nations and uh, what the, the coalition has, has been able to, uh, to undertake there. So specifically um, also in, in terms of the, the band council and, uh, and traditional people in the Atikama community. So May, Dimitri, can you, do you wanna tackle those first? Yeah, sure. Uh, so maybe uh, let's begin with the first question about the 100% electric mine and the fully carbon neutral project. Um, in our opinion, it's a very ambitious goal for the company. Um, it's uh, unclear how it is technically achievable. Uh, last year, uh, during the public audience of the commissions of uh, BAP, uh, the, we haven't heard a clear answer from the company and uh, the technical team uh, how to achieve a fully operational electrical mine uh, from the first year of operations. Uh, therefore, it is, um, we don't believe that the mine will be fully electrical and carbon neutral for its entire operational period. Uh, right now, in the feasibility study of the mine, uh, the scenario is retained that the at least the first five years of operations will be running on diesel. Uh, perhaps afterwards, um, the engineers will come up with a solution to, uh, to operate the mine um, electrically, but we have not seen any feasibility studies of uh, those operations, nor the budget associated uh, with uh, this type of operations. So until those, uh, this documentation was made available, um, I, uh, it, we have doubts about uh, the feasibility of this project. So fully electrical project and fully carbon neutral project, especially mm -hmm. because However, you operate the mine, there will be emissions, right? So um, this is to answer this part uh, of the question. And the second question in relation with the uh, First Nations community of At Atikamek, uh, so Nation of Manawan. Uh, we have been in touch with them. 
uh, periodically. Uh, and we are open to conversation about the project. We are open to provide them uh, some information that is at our disposal about the project and our approach. Um, and we believe that the nation of Manawan should decide for themselves how to view this project and uh, uh, evaluate the threats that it brings to their community, their, their land, and uh, their people. So it's, uh, it's up to them to, to make those decisions. And may, uh, if you'd like to add something. For uh, the mines electrification, uh, during the public uh, aud audiences, uh, it was uh, shown that there was no electrical truck for these open sky mines. These are uh, for um, underground mines, maybe, but for the other kind, it doesn't exist. So, the people from the Commission uh, demanded that uh, the promoter do uh, their homework, uh, starting uh, from a diesel powered mine over 26 years. So it's a, a marketing campaign when they say 100% electrical is totally wrong. The machines don't exist. We don't know whether they will be created. It was demonstrated with uh, presentations that it did not exist anywhere right now for uh, open sky mines. So the promoter um, had to to, uh, to show that they had to uh, uh, go to the ministry environment and provide a new feasibility study that would be based on a diesel trucks for a period of time of 26 years. It wasn't uh, given and the government uh, gave uh, authorization uh, for uh, starting the work. And in terms of the relationship with the uh, Etikamek and the, and the coalition? So, yeah, uh, just briefly, uh, yeah, just briefly, as I mentioned, uh, we we are open to discuss um, the project with the nation of uh, Etikamek, the nation of Manawan. Um, but we, we are we also believe that uh, it's uh, up to the nation of Etikamek to make up uh, their decision about the project based uh, on all the information available and based on their views of the project. Um, so we, we this is uh, this is all I can say for the moment about our relationship. To add to what uh, Dimitri was mentioning, we had a few exchanges with uh, the uh, band uh, council. So there were some communications, we shared our concerns and they mentioned as well that they didn't uh, really agree with what was presented in this uh, mining uh, project. They have a lot of concerns. They have a lot of questions and what we did is say that we're always available to um, talk uh, with the Manawana Tikamek community. And in the meantime, we are available. Uh, and I know they know, I, I think they know it too. They are probably acting uh, on uh, their side, but they know that we are open if we have, if they want to have a conversation to see uh, whether there might be some uh, avenues that could be uh, taken together. That's it. Great, thanks. So out of the other questions that we have before us, I think uh, there are a number around sort of the, the energy transition, but also the question of circular economy, the question of um, to what extent can we electrify and uh, 
and not continue to to expand consumption but actually reduce consumption so um, i'm going to throw this open to the to the panel here but um, you know if we simply electrify transportation aren't we simply maintaining the destructive this this destructive way of life and then at the same time we have companies uh, as Pyle pointed out repositioning themselves as uh, material service providers or something um, but maintaining the same corporate structures maintaining the, the same uh, capitalist underpinning of, of the whole system and to the extent that they're successful doing that is 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 that a good thing or is that uh, is that what we're what we're looking for I feel like that was a leading question. Like you had an answer right in there, uh, Jamie. <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, I, I really think about the fact that um, there's this false, uh, this false framing of, uh, you know, well, these are, you know, these are enormous changes we need to make. And are you saying we shouldn't make them because of the impacts of, of mining? Um, and you know, so so they're saying that it's better to instead, you know, increase production of these minerals six times, dig massive new holes in the ground, cause all these kinds of destructive impacts that we've described and heard about here, rather than making the kinds of systemic shifts that would reduce our footprint um, overall. I mean, they're both enormous things to do. One set would take some behavior changes as well as just kind of system as usual recalibration. Um, but they're not any more significant. It's just that we're able to export that harm and not, you know, it's out of out of our sight and out of our mind, sitting here as I am in California. <laughs> um, but obviously the impacts of those harms as well as the benefits of those harms are, are just sort of so inequitably distributed. Um, that if we were if we were evening out that playing field and we had justice and 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 equity and impact um, you know all measured in, um, I think those kinds of systemic shifts that would lead to reductions are not out of our grasp. Thanks, Thea. Would you like a last word on that one? Sure, I I completely agree with Pyle. This is as as she put it earlier a critical juncture, and both of the all of the pathways involve changes and transformations. Right, it's not like one is easy and one is hard. It's just that one has a lot of powerful you know lobbies in favor of it: the mining industry, the auto industry, the they donate to politicians who serve their interests. Right, we know that story. And on the other side. There are lots of communities around the world in the global north and global south um, who might have an interest in a quite different transformation that was more equitable, less resource intensive, and also confronted the climate crisis at the same time. I think the challenge for us as organizers and advocates is to do the organizing, educating, amplifying, et cetera, work so to connect, help sew those coalitions together, right? And it, it, it's, it's challenging. Like I think even some of the comments in the Q&A point to the fact that there are people in this room that have some deep disagreements over what the transit system might look like. I was just glancing at, at some of the comments. And, and so I think you know, we need to lean into those difficult conversations. We need to organize around them and we need to do so rapidly. Um, and, and so I think it's an organizing and educating question, um, not a question of like whether you know, there's more than one path, which there absolutely is, as Pyle pointed out very clearly. Thank you, Thea. Thank you, Pyle. Thank you, May. Thank you, Dimitri. And I'm going to turn it back over to Monique right now to close us out in a good way. And uh, thank you all for attending, everybody who's out there. I see 129 people uh, at the bottom of my screen. It's great you could all come and and uh, let's keep in touch. So thank you. And over to you, Monique. Language. Thanks, Jamie. I find it so encouraging uh, that there are people uh, who are um, so willing to work so hard to try to find some good answers and to stop the um, the extractive resources, uh, the resource extraction. I know how badly it affects my own community and communities like mine. Um, and uh, so when I see people working so hard together to try to change all that, it's uh, it gives me hope. 
And I'd like to thank you for that. Um, so I'd like to close this space with um, just a few words to the creator. Kachimi Gretsch Jemnado, thank you for the plants, for the water, for the trees, for the ones who fly, for the ones who swim, for the ones who crawl. Thank you for the furred, for the feathered, for the four-legged, and for the two-legged. And thank you very much for bringing everyone together here today with open hearts, with open minds. Help us to see beauty, help us to hear truth, and help us to work together for the betterment of all the communities with compassion, with kindness, and with a look to the future. Kachimigwitch, 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 Kachimigwitch. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope you have a good rest of your day.